I want to introduce our uh, keynote speaker, Carl Bass. Uh, I've gotten to know Carl a little bit. He's definitely a friend of Cal Poly's and definitely a friend of education. I'll let him tell you more about himself and how he came to be here today if he chooses. Um, but I will say that we got to acknowledge that Carl was really responsible for uh, this transition to making software and Autodesk products in particular free to education. And uh, this was a, a, a dream he had years ago and um, he made it happen. And it, so, um, you know, he's a tremendous friend of education and we're grateful to have him here today. I'll let him fill in the details. Um, but um, Carl's just a great guy, humble, and um, we're really, really grateful to have him uh, open up our conference here today. So Carl Bass, everyone. As soon as he unmutes, well, there he is. As soon as I learned to unmute my Zoom, like you think I would have learned by now. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, and yeah, um, I am a huge fan of Cal Poly, as, Bro as Rob and Martin know. Um, I, I am not an educator, but I come from a family of educators. My mom was a New York City school teacher. Both of her sisters were New York City school teachers. My wife's mother was a Chicago public city public uh, school teacher. So there's a lot of there's a lot of educators in the family. Um, this generation has seen, seems to have gotten bad. Um, I spent a bunch of years as the uh, CEO of Autodesk. I worked there as a, in a bunch of positions. Um, and um, about two and a half years ago, I stepped, I stepped down as CEO and went back to my workshops and started full time working on the stuff that I do. Um, this morning, I was just going to, Martin asked me to talk a little bit about a couple things. And so I was going to do that, but I'm happy. I mean, it's a small group, happy to answer questions and stuff. But I wanted to, I, I had some slides I was going to show you about uh, what I did during the coronavirus. And uh, we, can, we can start there and I'll talk about a couple other things. So um, I think it's okay if I share the screen, right? I'll yes. If that'll work. Um, okay. Does that work for everyone else? Can you guys see? Maybe. Yes. Yeah, we're good. You're good. Okay. So like the rest of you, I was going about my life when the coronavirus hit. And uh, I then got this uh, call um, from the folks down at JPL saying, could I help them finish up uh, some designs for some ventilators? Because if you remember back in February, March, everyone thought this was going to be the critical thing. And so how were we going to make ventilators for everyone? But what happened instead is um, I started to see, I started seeing what was going on here and started talking to all the local nurses and stuff. And they said that wasn't the problem. Instead was we just needed PPE. And so I thought of it as like this marshmallow problem. We said to ourselves, how are we going to make a lot of PPE really cheaply? And this is the time where everyone's trying to reuse N95 masks and they're getting soiled and nurses and doctors are wearing them for two weeks. So we said, what if we made some face shields? And the idea was we went to lunch, we came back and we said, what if we just take some plastic and attach it to our baseball hats? So, you know, sometimes things get out of control. So we, we had this idea, you can see the first prototype, we just have some bolts in, in the brim of the hat. Next thing we know, we're in full production. And so we're cutting them. Um, if you ever want to see an overused tool, 135 ton press break folding little pieces of plastic. Um, so we were cutting them on this industrial size router, folding them on the press break. Um, I engaged the entire family in making these things. Um, and we distributed them to nurses. Um, we distributed them to nurses and doctors and uh, got them out there. These were some of the quotes we got back. Um, we, we just didn't, you know, being on the outside and just reading the press, we didn't really appreciate how kind of dire the situation was until we started getting back stuff like that. Um, and then we started scaling up the effort. You know, we made a website, we made an instructable telling people how to do it so they could do it themselves. And 
one of the things that we found out during the course of this whole thing was um, just how um, inefficient the distribution was of equipment. So when we went, when we sent it to a government agency or a hospital administrator, they would hoard it or not give it out or something like that. Um, and so, so what we did, so what we did instead. Um, is we just made a website and said any nurse or doctor or fir fir first responder who needs this, just, uh, just send us a note and tell us how many you need and we sent them to them free of charge. Um, and, but we mailed them directly. So we would FedEx them overnight or UPS them overnight right into the places where we need them. This thing just like took on a life of its own and we went from making you know dozens a day to hundreds a day to then thousands a day and we got all these other people involved. The picture on the left is a, a local place in Berkeley called Girls Garage run by Emily Pilladin that uh, teaches uh, young girls how to make things, how to weld, how to fabricate, how to design. Also a whole bunch of families just got involved and came and picked up boxes every day. Um, they went out by UPS. One of the guys came on bicycle every day and picked up a, a hundred hats to make. This one woman took uh, about 400 a day and made it. A bunch of local companies did it. By the time we were done with this whole thing, um, we had about 250 people making shields. Um, and we you know, continued to distribute them all over. Um, at the end, we made about 35,000 uh, face shields. Um, about three, four weeks to, and, uh, and we distributed them and the total cost for the hat and the plastic and the shipping and everything was about three bucks a piece. Um, and we went and we paid it, we did a GoFundMe, we raised about $80,000 on our GoFundMe site to pay for it and uh, pay at least for most of it. And then, uh, and then, you know, and then we sent them everywhere. About five weeks ago, we decided or we thought that there would be no more need for this stuff. And um, we, we turned our attention to building a uh, very low cost, positive air pressure respirator um, that we can make from parts that you could kind of buy at Home Depot. So this is the first one. It starts from the inside of a hard hat, of a hard hat helmet. So we just took you know, a cheap hard hat helmet. That's the replaceable uh, ratcheting strap inside. Um, and then, and then we added the rest of the components, including a small computer fan and a baffle inside a little backpack. And right now we've sent this off to the FDA for fast track approval. And if we get it, um, uh, we will, we're just going to open source the project. So anyone who needs these can, ma can make them. As it turn, hey, this was my picture. I came into the shop after about three or four more, three or four months of making this. And this is my description of, you know, kind of the shit has hit the fan and we've run out of toilet paper. That's what the last four months had kind of felt like to me. And so this just summed it all up for me. It's like, it's hard to believe we're out of toilet paper, but it was all worthwhile. We, we, you know, we distributed them widely. We're still getting calls. We're starting to get it from schools now and a lot of manufacturing facilities who are trying to go back to work as, as well as a continuing stream of requests we're trying to figure out how to make more of these. More of these. Anyhow, um, after doing this, I've gone back. I was just going to show you. Here's the last three or four things I've been working on in the shop. So one was here's a canoe I just finished building with my son. Um, you can see the world's most over-engineered, generatively designed bracket holding up the seat there. Most people use a dowel with a bolt through it. Um, but we decided to overdo it just because we could. And so uh, we ended up making this crazy thing. I've continued doing some work on some generative design. This is a chair. Many of you know, I uh, did this thing where I turned a MIG welder into a metal 3D printer. And this, this is a metal 3D printer from a store-bought MIG welder. And that's a chair that was made with it. And my last two projects is this is what I'm currently working on is I've converted a 1950 Chevy um, pickup truck into an electric vehicle. You can see all the batteries in the back. You can all the, looks, 
looks very little like the Chevy truck. You know, it has all the great looks of the truck, but not many of the components. And the last project is, um, this is a Shelby Cobra that we've made into an electric uh, race car. So those are the projects I'm working on. And that's a little bit about the PPE. And um, so that's what, that's what I've been up to. Um, let, me, let me just kill this if I can. Unsharing the screen may be harder than sharing the screen. Shut, stop share. There we go. Okay. So yeah, that that's what I've been up to. Um, let me just talk for a minute about um, you know teaching during the, this thing. So first of all, my hats off to all of you who do the you know all the great work of teaching the students, and particularly, I am a huge fan of both hands-on learning and just-in-time learning. I think it's how the next generation is doing it. I think what you guys do is awesome. Um, I, you know, I find myself as a just-in-time uh, hands-on learner in my shop every day. You know, one of the interesting things is because of the variety of projects you get to see that I do, um, I, I, I find that I'm expert at nothing, um, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a novice at everything. So I go through this experience of trying to figure out each thing for myself as a problem. And I think, you know, one of the most important hands-on skills that you guys teach is just simple problem solving. How do you, you know, I just look at each thing in front of me and say, there's gotta be a way to figure out how to do this. And even though I may not be expert at it, you know, if you put one foot in front of the other and you, you know, you get a couple of neurons to fire in the right way, you figure, you figure out how to do these things. So um, it's been so it's been interesting in my household. I'm sure you guys all have interesting stories. I've had I have two 20 year old sons. My youngest son is actually a senior at Cal Poly. Um, so I've had two sons, two girlfriends, a nephew, a cousin, and my wife all living together. So um, I will tell you, every dinner is like Thanksgiving, and probably the hardest thing is. Uh, figuring out anything that eight of us can agree to watch on Netflix. So every, every night is just a small fight after dinner about what we're gonna, what we're gonna watch. And I'm, just, and I'm sure it's like all of you, but uh, it, it's been a very unusual period. Um, actually, uh, of, of, the, of the youngsters who've been here, two are Cal Poly students, and one is a master's student at a uh, university in uh, Canada. And so it's been interesting to watch them doing at-home learning. And what was interesting, at least um, for, for the Cal Poly students, they were like, the online classes were fine. You know, they didn't mind the lectures. As you guys know, like no labs and no access to shops is really hard, particularly at a place like Cal Poly. And so they all said the labs were there. They also added one thing interesting so I can rib all the teachers a little bit. They said, all the teachers made up for this semester by like doubling the amount of work. They said this was by far the most work they ever had in the semester. Um, Cause everyone thought they, they weren't doing a good enough job teaching. So they doubled up the work for the students which is a, a, little, a little thing to learn. But you know, I think for many of the kids I mean, I think they've been very resilient you know, in a, a, you know, in a learning how to learn this way. I think the hardest thing on most of the young people and I'm sure you guys have seen it too is just um, they're, they're at that age, they're generally more social animals than, you know, living with their parents and, you know, confined to a handful of people allows them to be. So, um, you know, that's what I've seen about it. You know, as we go forward, I just don't know what's going to happen. I've been talking to a number of my friends in the business world, uh, particularly in the tech world, and um, almost nobody is thinking about sending people back to work quickly. I was just talking to people who run two large companies and they said they've already told people they're not gonna expect people back in the office till January. My son, my older son who has a job, he's working out of my house in the Bay Area with a job in New York City. He just got a note from this medical research institute that they don't expect people back in the office or they won't require them until next June which is, I thought I'd gotten rid of my kid. And uh, 
<laughs> it doesn't look like I'm so lucky. <laughs> I'm nearly that lucky. He, he looks like he's here for the long haul. So um, I'm sure you all have similar stories to that. And I think it's a really uncertain time. And I think, you know, as we see, you know, the, the, the opening of schools is going to be really tricky. And I hope um, I people, I, I hope people are just being smart about how this, this is going to go down. Um, so that's it. That's what I had to say, but I'm happy to have a conversation with anybody about what's going on, any of the work I'm doing, um, giving software free to schools and universities, anything you guys want to talk about. If no Thank one wants to talk, <laughs> I'll go, I'll go to the, I'll go to the shop since my truck is calling for me. Well, thanks, Carl. Do we have any questions? What questions might you all have? I'd, I'd uh, probably like some contact information for Carl so I know how to get in touch with you. Okay, so the easiest way to get in touch is Carl Bass at Gmail. That's pretty easy. Um, yeah, it's Carl Bass at Gmail is the easiest way to reach me. You can also... Um, if you want to see any of the crazy projects I'm working on, you can just go to carlbass.com and I got all the projects there. And I post all the stuff that I'm doing like day by day on Instagram. And it's at carl.bass. So those are all those are three good ways to find me. And then I see people like John who can just walk down the street into my shop and say hello. Hey John. <laughs> hey Carl. Uh, Carl, how fast does your uh, electric Cobra go? It is scary friggin' fast. Mark, it, it is, okay, so it's not quite street legal yet, but that doesn't, take, that doesn't prevent us from taking it around the streets of Berkeley. Um, we had it out there the other day. It was, we were doing about 30 and I stomped on it and the entire rear end just jumped. So it, it'll do about 140 or 150. The only thing about it, so I have, to, I have two things to say about that. The first is it turns out that Cobras aren't really that good. You know, they don't hold the road nearly as well as people thought they did. They have kind of loose back ends. And so um, you gotta be a little bit careful unless you put something else on to give it some downward pressure. And number two is I have a rule that I don't drive anything faster than about 110 that I've welded. <laughs> you might need a roll cage and some protective equipment. You get yeah, it. We, 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 we got some stuff on there. Um, on, on the truck, you know, which is a completely brand new chassis and stuff, I, I geared it so I limited the top speed to just about 100. Since I don't think anyone wanted to see the, you know, 1950 Chevy going down the road at like 120 miles an hour. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it both of them accelerate. They have ridiculous acceleration. Yeah, um, that's what I've understood is electric cars really get off the line quick. Yeah, you know, it's just got it's it's got it's got torque all the way all the way up to nearly the top RPMs. So from zero to just short of the top RPMs, the torque is almost identical. So. That he, um, I heard you guys joking about your safety things. If you want some safety stuff, like going from mechanical stuff like machining and welding and whatever, to playing with high voltage automotive electronics, um, we have uh, in my shop. One of the things I have is the wall of shame. You know the way many machine shops show off all their favorite things. You know the coolest aerospace part they made. We do the opposite. We hang up the kind of the mistakes. And, and, it's, and there's a real reason behind it. One is because we all do it, but two to say to everybody, look, people make mistakes doing this. Be as safe as you possibly can, but you're gonna make a mistake. Don't let it scare you off, et cetera. And uh, I gotta say that automotive electronics have added more to the wall of shame in a short period of time. Um, I didn't know you could put enough, co enough current through copper to vaporize it. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Carl, I've got a question for you. Um, as you've talked with people in industry, what are these people looking for from our high school students as they're graduating? What kind of skills, knowledge base do they need? 
Yeah, so I, th I think there are two things that are somewhat, you know, contradictory, but both true. Um, one is I think they look for people coming out of high schools and colleges um, with some specific skills. So, um, you know, whether it's, you know, and, and it's real world skills, like, you know, if they're going to go work in manufacturing, they're able to run a CNC machine, they're able to weld, they're, they're able to run the press brake, that they actually have the practical skills to do this. Um, I think the other thing that employers are really looking for is people who have the capacity to learn and to be flexible and change. Because um, everybody knows whatever we're doing today that is the you know, top of the pyramid, 10 years from now, it's going to be different. And so, you know, the best employees are going to be the ones who are the problem solvers, the ones who have an eagerness to learn, have the flexibility, um, have the ability to solve problems. You know, so it, it's both things. Yes, you need very pragmatic skills today, but you also, I don't, I, I think we no longer live in a time where you're going to learn a skill as an apprentice when you're, you know, 19 years old and practice that same job for the next 40 years. Who else has something for Carl? Um, <clears throat> Carl, the ratio of uh, technicians to engineers, what, what's industry's real needs? Oh. You know, it's in, I mean, I think in every possible technical career I've seen, um, I, I think there's an ability for more technicians, I think, than uh, engineers. Like, we've overdone the need for uh, big degrees, if you will. So I worked most of my life in the software industry. You know, I spent, you know, 40, 40 years, you know, building software. Um, even, in, even in software engineering, there are so many jobs that can be done by people with technical skills, but they don't necessarily need, certainly they don't need master's degrees and PhDs. Um, as you get to the physical things, I, I think, you know, well-trained technicians are you know, kind of the godsend to industry. Um, you know, I, I, I've worked, um, I've spent a, a bunch of time with, uh, over the last three years with a number of startups and, you know, more established company who are doing this interesting combination of physical things with smart software, which I think is the future of most products. It's some combination of the two things. So I was an advisor to the people at Google working on the X projects. Um, I'm on the board of Planet, which is putting uh, CubeSats into space. Um, I'm involved with a company that's doing uh, robotic um, construction equipment. Um, as an example, there's a whole bunch more companies. And in each one of these, having really good technicians is hugely valuable. So having really good machinists. Um, but like I said before, the specific skills matter. But I think also, particularly these environments where they're trying to figure things out for the first time, kind of the flexibility and agility um, and you know, willing, willingness to learn something new. Um, you know, it was interesting. I've watched my younger son who has an internship this year up in Nevada, um, working at a place that's doing reclamation of um, minerals from batteries. And I did, so I asked him last night what he's been working on. He says, well, the first day they handed me a manual on this gigantic Siemens furnace where the controls were working. They were trying to get me to debug that. And then the other day, I was, you know, the last three days, I've been building stuff and been running to Home Depot and, you know, cutting two by fours, you know, and, and we're framing something out in the lot to build a new te a test rig for something. And I think that's the nature of work a little bit more. I think our jobs are going to be less clear. Um, I think they're going to be, 
more multidiscipline. The teams are going to be more multidiscipline. And I think one of the things is I love the deep knowledge we impart to people, whether it's about, you know, electrical engineering or, you know, um, electronics or machining or welding. On the other hand, I, I emphasize to every kid who comes along when they ask me, I say, look, don't make it through school just doing one thing. You know, if you're learning how to be a machinist, learn something about software. Just enough. It's going to matter. Learn enough about electronics. I, I, I think we need a broad base and we need some deep knowledge as well. And I know that sounds contradictory, but I believe it to be true. And, you know, most importantly, you know, we live in an age right now where you can learn almost anything um, on the internet. And I think we have a generation of people who've grown up in, with this just-in-time learning when they need to do it. So I'll give you an example. When uh, I was doing the truck, um, I had to change the differential. I had to change the gearing in the differential. I had never changed the gearing in a differential. I went online. There's a lovely gentleman who does a YouTube channel on exactly that. He films himself, a, you know, from um, here to here with his hands. He wears a white lab coat, and he perfectly explained how to change the gear on a differential in turn, you know, in terms of shimming and everything else. So. I think, you know, so rather than think of yourself as I'm going to change 5,000 differential gears in my life, one day I'm changing the differential gear, another day, you know, today I'm, I'm instrumenting um, the Chevy and I'm collecting all the data with Arduinos that I've programmed myself. And I think that's more the nature of what work's going to look like for people. And I think the most valuable employees are going to be the people who have, um, kind of the wherewithal um, to go out and figure out how to solve these problems. And so it's this combination of not only having the right tool set, but kind of having the right mindset. And the mindset is, I, 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 I'm smart, I'm capable, and I, can, I get access to new info, and with that, I can do it. On the other hand, I think there's no replacement for being really good and really well versed in a couple things, you know, that you know how to do and you know deeply. So from our high school programs to community college is uh, the real need right now. Yeah. Except for Cal Poly engineers, uh, they're, they're hands on people. Yes. Right, Mark? We, we like the Cal Poly. When, when we were hiring, um, we always had this ranking which was, the Cal Poly engineers came out of school knowing, you know, how, what to do and how to do it. Um, the Berkeley engineers, a little less so. The Stanford engineers, we didn't want to hire. <laughs> how's, how's USC, uh, uh, University of San Diego? I don't know much about University of San Diego. I mean, there's a handful of Midwestern colleges and universities, um, ASU, you know, some places like... Um, RPI and RIT, Case Western. I mean, there are a number of universities that, you know, similar to Cal Poly, have a real hands-on engineering program. And um, a lot of employers look, you know, look for those. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, you're welcome. Carl, uh, I've got a question. Um, watching uh, Lily and uh, Nick um, working with their other students, do you see the way the students are working on teams changing now that they're not face to face. Yeah. So first of all, I mean, I, I mean, that's another aspect where I think that is really important. And I think it, whether it's in high schools or in, you know, colleges is this teaming aspect to it. Because once you hit industry, almost nothing do you do, do you do by yourself? And the most successful people are the people who, um, learn how to work in teams. You know, it's interesting, uh, when I used to do all these things in front of employees at work, people would say, what do you look for in a good employee? And, you know, somewhat jokingly, but somewhat seriously, I used to say, it's people who get shit done. Like, at the end of the day, and, and I meant that in the way of they got stuff done, but they also did it, you know, with the cooperation, you know, by working with others to get the stuff done. So, it, 
So one of the things that's interesting is, you know, so like, you know, Willie's, you know, been on the uh, Baja team. Um, the, thing that, the thing that goes off most on his phone is the Slack channel from the Baja team. Like for three years, that was the thing that went off. And so I think, I think the kids are pretty good at, you know, learning how to do it. They've, you know, they're flexible. They've adapted much faster than I. You know, I watch them um, doing their senior project. I watch them do the Baja team. They're on Slack, they're on Zoom. They'll use whatever tools they need to, to do it. Um, you look, I, I, I think, I think it's hard, you know, one of the things I've been asking is, you know, my friends, the CEOs of these big tech companies, how people are doing during this, you know, in terms of productivity and efficiency. And resoundingly, they're saying most of the people in companies are doing pretty well. You know, fewer meetings, fewer people in the meetings um, is good. Um, the engineers are probably the best in that they're the happiest. Um, you know, they don't have their bosses looking over their shoulder, calling meetings at 1030 in the morning and kind of, you know, ruining the flow of the day. Um, on the other hand, I mean, having worked in that environment, there is something that comes about by talking to others, by running into it, you know, just the chance meeting, you know, you run into someone in the cafeteria or, you know, walking down the hall where you go, I'm trying to figure this out and somebody gives you an idea. Um, so a little of the spontaneity, I think, is killed, the creativity, and social, certainly some of the social aspect. I mean, for all of us who have sat on Zoom a lot over the last three or four months, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a soul-killing experience. Um, well, you know, like, I, I hope this doesn't last forever because this is a hell of a way to hang out with people. No offense intended to our present company. I love being with you guys, but it would be more fun to be in person. It would be more fun to be in a shop. It would be more fun to be making stuff together than it is doing this. So, um, but, you know, I think we all have to make, you know, make the best of it until, you know, some things get better. Well, hopefully it will get better. Yeah. Carl, we have uh, time for a great success story. A success story? Yes. Personal or professional? Um, uh, no, uh, profession, professional student success. Um, Bowman High School just put in a manufacturing program. Oh, you're going to tell me about it. Perfect. Uh, great. And uh, a young man that I know very well, because uh, I know his grandfather, uh, uh, fellow Rotarian, um, started out with one Haas machine in the program. They had a, a couple of mills and a uh, a uh, new lathe also, and they're up to three hosp uh, machines right now that the district has bought. And uh, he got an, an interview with a in local engineering company uh, for an internship. Went down there, they hired him. Uh, he's now training their people on how to uh, operate the hosp machine. That's fantastic. Those are the stories I like to hear. Yeah, no. One, 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 of, one of the things that I love is getting people, you know, kind of trained on the tools that will work for industry. So, you know, when it, whether it's a high school shop or, you know, a college shop where they have the same kind of tools and doing it. Um, one of the things I saw in my career was one of the best ways to introduce new technology to industry was through students that, um, there's nothing better than, you know, somebody wants to do something new and um, you, in industry, you know, people have a lot of excuses why it couldn't be done. You know, so they'll say, oh, it'll be too expensive or we always done it this way. And I love when the kids are able to say, you know what, for the last three or four years, I've done it in school this way and it works fine. And next thing they're teaching everyone else how to do it. It's just, it's just a great way to introduce new technology. Um, you know, with people who aren't afraid of it, who have nothing to lose by it. And so um, I'm, I'm glad to hear stories like that. Anything else for Carl? Yeah, otherwise, um, I got to go debug my Arduino code on my Chevy truck. <laughs> 
Arl, uh, how many times did you have to press in and out that pinion shaft? Uh, oh, um, three. Three? Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. By, by the way, Google, Google this guy. He, he's awesome at teaching you how to do it. That's cool. You know, I was always wondering, like, what, what that yellow grease is for and, you know, like, what does it show? And for mar <laughs> marking the gears. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Um, so, Yeah. You know, only a few times, but it is true, like, you know, when you do these projects, like I said, and you're kind of a novice each time, you just, you know, some things just take longer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, but, you know, if you stick with it, it uh, you do it. Yeah, it's uh, not magic, though. You can learn it. Yeah. No, right now, I'm actually, you know, I designed the circuit, you know, and I wrote the, wrote the code, and now I'm uh, turning it into a PCB board. I've never made a PCB board before, but... You know, oh, cool. having all my loose wires between my Arduinos just didn't seem like it was gonna, you know, work for bouncing around in that truck. No, um, once you make your own board, I, I do it often actually. And once you, you make your own board and you have the little microchip on there and only the parts you need, yes. it, there's a satisfaction that comes with that. And you know, it's so, yeah. so much smaller than what it could have been. Right, right, right. So that's it. I'm in that process because uh, actually the fun thing was is you get um, the truck has all these old analog gauges. And I wanted to figure out how to drive the analog gauges with all the information that was digital. Uh, so you're doing OBD2 and taking that? No, no, no. Away. So what I did is I went into the CAN bus. Uh -huh. And uh, for three of them, I'm I, I replaced the gauges with voltmeters. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just driving the voltmeters with signals <laughs> off the CAN bus. And That's then the, the last one, because it's a mechanical speedometer. Yeah. I'm reading the speed off the motors, the RPMs, mm -hmm. and I have a little servo that's turning the mechanical cable for the speedometer. I see. So my Arduino tells the little motor to turn. And so rather than my transmission turning the cable, I have a little motor there turning the cable. Uh, that's very cool. And now I have all the old gauges on the, on the truck are running. That's cool. We're actually yeah. working on a pretty similar project. That's neat. <laughs> Yeah, but, it, but I've gotten into the OBD2 stuff too. And, you know, but mostly I've been doing it at the CAN bus level. So the CAN bus, yeah. Anyhow, like I said, I would just want to thank all the educators for the awesome job you do teaching our kids. And uh, thanks and have a good conference. Thank you very much for being with us today, Carl. Okay, Carl thanks, Rob. Nice to see you. See you guys.